Doopy doo. All right, back again. There we go. Yeah, no, it's kind of weird having like these different Zoom links, but uh, I managed to make myself a cup of coffee, so it wasn't entirely uh, a loss. Okay, so I had a cool question from Dipper, which I didn't see until I ended the Zoom about 23andMe, which is a it's a really interesting topic actually. It's a very uh, ooh contentious topic actually in many ways. Um, but in terms of uh, like ancestry, which is kind of really what 23andMe does now because the uh, FDA gave them a bit of a kicking for trying to give uh, disease likelihoods <laughs> based on what they were doing, rightly so. Um, but essentially what they do is they look for uh, certain what are called SNPs. So uh, SNPs. And those are single, uh, if I can type, nucleotide polymorphisms. Right, so essentially what that is, is a single base pair change, right, from an A to a C, T or G, let's say, uh, in your genome, which is associated with something, usually. Actually, it doesn't have to be, but uh, when we talk about them, it's usually because they're associated with something. And so it doesn't mean that that change is a function of any of the genes that you may have, Oh, you got a panda t-shirt, Rosie. God, I hate pandas. Um, yeah. Um, these are the best, especially no. red pandas. Red pandas, favorite. yes. Giant pandas. We better not get on that topic because otherwise <laughs> we won't get anything else done. Um, and so basically what they're looking at is SNPs that are associated with particular traits or particular ancestry. Right, so if you are from Southern Europe, let's say, most likely you will have changes in uh, DNA which controls melanin production, right? Because you're closer to the equator, you're going to be exposed to more UV radiation, and so that confers an advantage, uh, like a fitness advantage, because you're likely to get let get less skin cancer, right? Um, and so it doesn't always have to tie into a particular trait or process, but essentially it's a correlation, right? And so when you send off some spit or whatever to 23andMe, what they're doing is saying, well, what, which of these SNPs correlate which, with, with which of these traits well, or ancestry, right? And so there, it's not an absolute, it's just based on kind of having as large a possible uh, data set to get the most accurate results, right? But it is correlation, right? So if I did one, I'd probably find mostly Northern European ancestry because uh, I am white as white as they get, you know, I burn just looking at the sun outside. Um, but, you know, most of my family's from Scotland and Germany, for example, right? So, but there might be other stuff going in there. Uh, in terms of health, it's a lot more contentious because uh, we don't fully understand the basis for most uh, health outcomes, right? And also because there is a very large environmental aspect to most health outcomes too. So you may have, uh, you know, particular genotype which gives you a 60% chance of getting heart disease, right? By the age of 60, let's say. Uh, but, you know, if you're real fit and you take care of what you eat and you have like good cholesterol levels and, you know, you do an ultra marathon every now and then, uh, most likely you're not going to have heart problems, right? And so that's, uh, that's why trying to predict whether or not you'll get disease is a very difficult thing to do and really shouldn't be done by like a piece of paper or an email you get from some company, right? And that's what genetic counselors are for, essentially. Um, and that's even when, you know, that is robust. I mean, even, for example, what would happen if you had a very high chance of getting uh, 
I don't know, Huntington's disease. What can you do about it? Nothing very much right now, unfortunately, right? So is it helpful to know that you would have that? Um, as for Widow's Peak, I don't know, but Widow's Peak is a, is, a, is a fairly complex trait. It's not a single gene trait. And so as it's a complex trait, like most observable traits are, uh, the likelihood of being able to figure that out through looking at your ancestry is going to be difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. Um, like, for example, eye color is, oh, I think like five different genes uh, control eye color, at least, maybe more. I'm not like fully up on the genetics of eye color. And so, uh, you know, figuring out what particular eye color you have just based on your ancestry is not always trivial. Some people, it may be, right? If, you know, every single person for as long as, you know, like human memory goes in your family had brown eyes, then you'll probably have brown eyes, right? It's fairly straightforward, but it's actually a fairly complex trait too. So I shouldn't worry about that too much. Like, for example, I've got really hairy toes. Don't know why, but that's also part of my ancestry because my dad did and I think my granddad did and something like that. So clearly having hairy toes is a somewhat dominant trait and presumably confers great fitness advantages on me maybe keeping my toes warm like trekking through the alps or something galen good question um for some things right so uh what we'll actually do so the question was about uh talking about different traits and uh like eye color for example so typically what my approach is, because, you know, obviously there are thousands and thousands of traits, right? Some of which are, uh, <laughs> my dad actually told me that once, funny enough, Rosie, uh, or Rose, sorry. Um, what we'll be doing is looking at the different types of traits, right? Simple versus complex. So, uh, and essentially my aim is to kind of give you the tools by which you can understand traits like eye color, for example, um, so that when you come across those traits in your own research or your own particular travels through science, then you can understand them uh, more readily than if you hadn't taken this course, for example. So occasionally we'll use different examples, right? Because it's just kind of fun and it's nice to, to talk about stuff like that. Um, but generally the idea is to kind of give you a kind of more of a toolkit, I guess, by which you can understand that stuff. Um, so Dipper for, um, yeah, so that that's also having traits that is in the middle or different from either your parents is a classic sign of a complex trait. So simple traits, single gene traits, for example. Uh, so for example, cystic fibrosis, most single gene traits in humans are congenital disease traits. So if you think about sickle cell anemia, for example, is another one. Uh, cystic fibrosis is a good one. Huntington's maybe. Uh, I don't actually know enough about Huntington's to be confident about saying that. Um, but sim simple single gene traits will give you that kind of binary outcome, right? You either have the disease or you don't. Maybe there'll be a, like a trinary outcome genetically where you have the disease, you don't carry the disease or you're a carrier, right? For a uh, autosomal recessive gene like cystic fibrosis, right? Not a sex linked one like eye color, uh, like uh, color blindness rather. Um, but for anything that you get either something which is different to anything seen in your ancestry, right? So not something recessive that skipped a generation, but something novel or something that's like an intermediate, um, almost certainly you're looking at a complex trait, right? Which is caused by multiple different genes acting in different 
pathways or processes or whatever. So for example, uh, both my brother and I are over six foot tall. I'm actually a little bit taller than my brother, which is neat. Um, and younger too, so I can kind of rag on him about that. Um, but my parents are five foot six, five foot seven, something like that. So my dad always used to joke that, you know, uh, I came with the, the milk delivery, right? You know, I was like from the milkman. Um, but height is a very much a complex trait if you think about it, right? It's a complex gene by environment interaction. You know, it depends on the quality of your diet. It depends as you're growing. It depends on, you know, how your body plan is laid out. How long do your bones extend for during fetal development? You know, a whole bunch of different things, right? So um, that's how it's possible to have something which is very different from your parents. But also a lot of other traits, you do show some of the stuff that was in either or both of your parents, right? So it's kind of a mix, right? That's what makes it so interesting, right? That's why genetics is such a fun topic to talk about because um, really you go from like the stuff that you can see here and then you start getting into like really complex uh, kind of biology, biochemistry, you know, talking about, you know, melanin production, uh, the genes that control melanin production, uh, melanin import into where it's going, melanin processing, uh, you know, all of those different processes are involved in eye color, for example, or hair color, you know. And so you can see how, you know, you change one of those processes, but maybe not another, and you'll get a very different uh, outcome in terms of phenotype than the reverse. So usually, to be honest, Whenever people ask me questions like that, my usual answer is I don't know, because most stuff is uh, that we talk about in terms of observable traits is the result of multiple gene, multiple genes and gene by environment interactions. Right. So even if it is known, right, which isn't always the case, the likelihood that I know it for any given trait is not that high, right? Some things I do know about just because I'm interested. Uh, cat, fur genetics, I know a fair bit about randomly, right? Because it's a fun thing to talk about for genetics. You know, kind of the actual, all the different genes involved in eye color, I do not. But this is also the, the class in which I, or the course rather, uh, in which I correct a lot of the um, sloppy thinking that goes into teaching genetics before this point, right? So things like tongue curling, which I can do, you know, earlobes, stuff like that. None of those are single gene traits. Widow's peak, for example, which depending on how I cut my hair, I either do or I don't have, right? Is also not a single gene trait. So most things that you can see as of yourself as a human are complex traits, uh, which also makes them interesting. Okay, so doop, doop, doop. pardon me. Let's get on to this stuff. But also, you know, I think these things are what make genetics so interesting, right? I have to say that's, that's kind of why I'm a geneticist because it's just a constant puzzle, right? You know, a constant, oh, how does that work, right? That's, that's kind of why I, why I enjoy uh, genetics so much, is that there is literally so much uh, that we don't know, right? It's kind of easier to talk about stuff you don't know than it is about stuff that you do know, to be honest. Okay, so essentially in terms of genetics, really we're talking about flow of information, right? So this, that's really what I want to spend time on in this uh, class period, uh, so to speak. And it's really a way of thinking about genetics where what we're thinking about is information, right? Because information is what we pass on to 
our offspring. It's what we receive from our parents. And depending on what information we're talking about, we either get 50-50 from our parents or we get it all from our mother, right? And talking about mitochondrial DNA here. So, or if you're a plant, you know, uh, chloroplast DNA too. So really it's the, the information which is passed from generation to generation. And that information basically encodes the entire cookbook, I guess you could say, of what makes you you, right? And lots and lots and lots of different ways. Even things which are as complex and hard to pin down as intelligence or empathy or uh, hard work or any of those kinds of things, right? They all have a genetic component to some extent, right? It's hard to say how much, um, but that's all controlled by what DNA you have, right? Because your DNA control contains all the instructions to make you as an organism and determines a lot of how you are as an organism too, right? And so really, whenever we talk about information, we have to start with DNA, right? Because that's the, the, the starting point, right? But it's not the end point because DNA is only a repository of information. It doesn't do anything else, right? It just sits there. Proteins are the things that do stuff by and large, right? Always have to add that caveat because RNAs do a lot of stuff too. Um, but proteins are generally what we think of as doing something, right? And so we also have to get that information, not just from generation to generation in terms of transmission genetics, but from DNA into protein, right? We need to convert it, right? Take the information to DNA and turn it into uh, protein, which is what actually does stuff, right? And then as soon as we talk about that, we open up this whole massively complex world of how is that controlled, right? And really, how is that controlled is as big, if not bigger, a deal than what is being controlled in terms of a gene sequence or a protein sequence. Right. And so if we want to think like big, big scale in terms of time, there's a very strong argument. And if any of you ever take my dev developmental biology course, which is possible because I'm teaching it in spring, like once in a blue moon, um, you kind of learn about how it's both the control of gene expression as well as the gene that is being expressed, which contributes to the evolution of a species, right? Changes in those things. It's not just changes in gene sequence, right? Because if you compare our genetic sequence with that of our most closely related uh, uh, other species with which we, sorry, I got a mustache hair poking up in my nostril. Um, if though we share a last common ancestor, say like great ape or chimpanzee or something like that, we have very, very similar DNA, right? If we compare me and any of you or you with each other, we are all almost like genetically identical. I'm not talking like Star, Star Wars clone troopers, uh, like Boba Fett kind of identical, but the difference is that we are far more alike than we are different genetically, right? So we're not just interested in the, the what, right? The, you know, what is the sequence of that gene? We're also interested in the how, how is it controlled? Like when is it turned on, where, to what extent, in response to what, right? And as soon as we get into that, you know, it just blows up huge, right? And that's really, probably the last two PowerPoints that we'll be going through in great depth in this course are on the control of gene expression. And those are two of the hardest ones that you'll come across in this course, right? Because it is a very complex topic. 
Anyway, I'm kind of going off on a tangent. I tend to go off on these every so often. Hopefully they don't get all kinds of confusing. Um, but anyway, it's fun, fun stuff. So coffee time. There you go. We can have uh, children's animated film trivia too. If I were to say Sweet Nectar of Life, what film am I quoting from? Bonus points for what animal I'm quoting. Sweet Nectar of Life. Come on, someone's got to watch this film. I'm, <laughs> it's a crab. What film? The Crab from Finding Nemo. Yes, yes. Excellent. Good stuff. Oh, Sweet Nectar of Life. Manna from heaven. There you go. It's one of my favorite bits of the whole film. Anyway, so uh, you get uh, like a gold star or something, whatever I can give you. So essentially, what we start with is DNA, right? And so DNA has a very particular structure. That structure is uh, really important for a whole bunch of things. It's important because uh, it's how it's created, right? Or it's important for how it's created. It's important for how it's read, you know, because again, this is information. We're going to read it and uh, kind of like write that into a different form, which is mRNA or RNA, depending on uh, what it's going to do. And also the structure of DNA is actually key to how we can do those kind of genetic comparisons to like Australopithecus and to Neand you know, Neanderthals and to Homo erectus and, uh, you know, Utsi Iceman, who was shot in the back with an arrow on a glacier in the, in the German Alps, for example, which is a really cool story, uh, which I'll refrain from going into right now, right? So, you know, it kind of ties into why is DNA such a stable molecule that lasts for potentially, uh, you know, tens of thousands of years or more, right? And so the kind of like, and in many ways, this is like a recap of stuff you already know. So if you already know, that's cool. And if you don't, or you forgot, that's fine as well. But really with each nucleotide, right? A nucleotide uh, is kind of one unit of information, right? Often referred to as a base, right? So we'll quite often, uh, If we talk about nucleotides, I guess it's kind of a little bit fuzzy in language here, right? Uh, so that's like an A, C, T, or G, right? But it's also referred to as a base, uh, even though that's the nitrogenous base, technically speaking, right? The A, the C, the G, or T bit. Um, and that's often also called a base pair, right? Because in DNA, it's going to be paired with another base, a complementary base. So A's will be uh, um, hydrogen bonded to T's and C's with G's and so on, right? So that is one of these, right? So for every nucleotide or base or base pair, hello, doggo. Let me show you my dog, Luna. She's been given her boat. Oh, that's my foot as well. There you go. Off she goes. She's now going to proceed to try and bury it in the couch or the backyard or under the couch or any of that stuff. So we have uh, three parts make up each nucleotide, one part of which is going to be different between the nucleotides. The other two uh, we're saying, oh, the puppies are in their, their new, um, the homes rows. Uh, yeah, we've been through two, two sets of puppies uh, over the last year. Um, yeah. All kinds of places. One of them went off to Ohio. Uh, one went to New Jersey and uh, she's getting really pampered because uh, I think she has a very wealthy foster mum. Or new mum, I guess, uh, and one a couple of them were local as well. So yeah, all over the country. We'll probably be getting some more in a little while too. So the bit that changes is this uh, nitrogenous base. It's called a nitrogenous base because 
it has a bunch of nitrogens in it really that's kind of the the reason behind that and we have two different potential shapes broadly speaking we either have a single ring uh base right so ah, i can't spell single single ring base equals c uh, cytosine or thymine and those are pyrimidines crap can't see what i'm writing there you go and that looks smaller double ring bases those are going to be adenine or guanine those are called purines so you have two types of nucleotides purines and pyrimidines essentially now the other bits are a phosphate group so that's that bit with a p surrounded by oxygens that's called phosphates and a five carbon sugar I had to call it six carbon but it's not five carbon and it is a i always call it like a cupcake with a cherry on top right that's kind of what it looks like so those two things the phosphate and the sugar the ribose hence deoxyribonucleic acid right the ribo part refers to the sugar those two constitute the backbone of dna right that's almost like the the upright of a ladder right the rungs being the individual nitrogenous bases and this structure this particularly the structure of the backbone is really important because it gives dna directionality so dna has a direction not as in it knows what it's going to be when it grows up but it is different from one end to the other and that direction is basically created by which carbon the phosphate is attached to and which carbon this hydroxyl group down here is attached to so and then quite handily numbered for you phosphate group is always attached to the five prime carbon which is like five apostrophe that's that means five prime and the three prime oh is always attached to the three prime carbon in dna got to be really clear about that so three prime oh is the only uh kind of oh in dna and that's why it's called deoxy ribonucleic acid in rna you have two a three prime and a two prime oh hello doggo well oh, looks like she's buried her bone because she doesn't have it with her right now that's one of uh two really big differences between dna and rna there she is again probably sniffing stuff wondering where the food's at and the reason why that three prime oh is so important and why it confers directionality is that oh is essential for adding a new nucleotide to the end of that dna strand so i'll just write that up this chat will get posted to Blackboard uh, this afternoon after lab sometime. So you will get these notes too. Uh, obviously, it doesn't prevent you from making your own as well. So that 3'OH is required 
for adding a new uh, nucleotide via the creation of a oops, phosphodiester bond. Bond. James Bond. I'm so impressed that two people out of a class of like 20 got that Finding Nemo quote. That was super neat. That's much better return than I've got previously. Okay, I'll have to think of some like more challenging uh, family animation quotes to test you with. And so that direction is important because A, you can only make DNA in that direction. So DNA is always made if we're using this image in front of us down. You can only add new bases at the bottom of that strand at the three prime end. It's also important because that's the direction in which RNA is made, kind of. Yeah, it's a little more complicated. We'll talk about that later. Right, so mRNA or RNA in general has the same directionality. RNA or mRNA is translated to proteins. Guess what has directionality as well? Amino acid sequences, which we'll get to later. Right. So these fundamental facts, and which I'm sure you already know, you know, because you're in genetics, right? So you must have taken GenBio one. Right. These are like real foundational facts. If you don't get this, other stuff is not going to make any sense whatsoever. Right. So that's why we're spending time, is because it's really, really important. And as always, if you've got any questions, which you probably don't at this point, because it's fairly straightforward stuff, just ask. And also, if you're busy no taking notes and I move on, um, obviously I can't see all of you. I can see Mr. Robert. Um, but if you're still taking notes, you're like, whoa, 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 uh, with your other hand, unmute your mic and just say, give me a second, I'm trying to catch up because I don't want to overrun uh, your ability to make notes if you are making notes. And so that's not the entire picture, right? Because DNA is double-stranded. And this, not just that it's double-stranded, but it, that it forms this uh, anti-parallel double helix is, uh, give me a second, Diva, um, is the reason why, or one of the reasons why DNA is so robust, right? That you can go out into the environment as long as it isn't exposed to a lot of UV radiation and you'll be able to get intact DNA back, right? Is because of this very robust uh, double backbone structure, right? Protects the information on the inside, protects it from degradation. Um, yes, Dipper, so, Essentially, what I do after I finish a class, normally I only do like one or two a day. This is a little crazy. So in the afternoon, once I've finished teaching and had another cup of coffee, um, I will post the Zoom session to YouTube, any pictures, and the chat session, like that thing that you just asked me a question in, to Blackboard. And so you'll be able to go back to these later, like say you're kind of going through your notes, and you're like, oh, you said something about that. What is it again? You'll be able to go back to the Zoom chat or the actual Zoom session itself, if you're willing to kind of figure out where in the Zoom it was and get that information. Yeah, so again, you know, if you do, but if you do get like caught and you kind of run out of, uh, like time before I move on to the next slide, just let me know and I'll uh, I'll pause or I'll you know tell some kind of bad joke or something. Um, actually, or I'll go let the dog out because she's pestering me. I'll be back in a second.
Now, annoyingly, she's going to ask to be let back in in about ooh, five minutes, probably. So I might have to go up again. Uh, and it's another key point, too, is not just is it an anti parallel, well, it's an anti parallel double helix, which is one thing which I'll get back to. Um, but also, it's not an even twist. Right, so it's not like you get two bits of wire and like a you know a twist tie or something and twist it together. It has a kind of a alternating tight versus loose, tight loose, tight loose kind of twist, right? Which is actually called the major groove, right? Which is the kind of the looser or the bigger gap, and the minor groove, which is where those two backbones are tighter together. Right. This, I guess you could call it topology, right? Structure of the DNA is also important, even aside from the information itself. But the actual uh, structure is important for being recognized by other proteins. And the anti parallel bit is really important because essentially what it's saying is we have one strand going down five to three prime, like so, we have our second strand going up, right? Those are what are paired together, right? We don't have them both going in the same direction. We have them in going in opposite directions, the two strands of DNA. And that produces all kinds of both kind of problems, but also quirks. For example, it means that you can have information on this strand in terms of gene structure, protein sequence information. You can also have information on the opposite strand, right? It's not just one linear bit of information. You can have it on both strands. It causes problems in uh, DNA replication. Well, not problems, but, you know, complexity, I guess. So one quick question make sure you're all still awake hopefully you are how are the bases these kind of rungs in the middle of this ladder how are they held together what what bonds hold together the a's and the t's and g who who's that hydrogen bonds super cool who was that actually marisa Hi, Marisa. Yes, exactly. So isn't that kind of no good deed goes unpunished kind of thing, Marisa? Why are hydrogen bonds so good for holding together these two strands? Why not covalent bonds, for example? Hydrogen bonds are harder to break than covalent. It's actually the opposite, which is kind of cool. So hydrogen bonds are what hold water molecules together, like in water, my coffee, for example, and what are broken to create steam. So if you think about what energy, how much energy it takes to, you know, boil a kettle to make a cup of coffee versus how much energy it takes to liquefy a steak, which is kind of held together by a covalent bonds, generally speaking. Um, Hydrogen bonds are a lot weaker, right? And that's really, really useful because you think about DNA, right? So all the bonds in the actual backbone, right? So if we go up here, come on. So all of the bonds holding the backbone together are covalent bonds, right? So they take a lot of energy to form and they take a lot of energy to break. All the bonds between the A's and the T's and the C's and the G's are hydrogen bonds. Right, so there are enough of them to hold the DNA together, just the same as there are enough in water so that like uh, water boatmen, pond skippers, things like that, insects that walk on top of water can do so, right? Because there's enough surface tension, right, in the water to hold up their weight if it's spread, you know, kind of evenly enough. But similarly, they're easy to break, right? So you can actually, coffee down you can unzip and then stick back together again the double helix with relatively little amount of energy not no energy 
right? Because you don't want your DNA just kind of falling to pieces. But sufficient that you can open it to copy it or to uh, replicate it and then shut it back again without expending huge amounts of energy. So although you go the, the other way around, it's really, really cool to compare those two because covalent bonds are the reason why DNA kind of sticks around for the thousands and thousands of years. The hydrogen bonds are how it gets to open and close at will in your cells, in your nuclei, um, whether they're dividing or, or transcriptionally active. And it's also the number of bonds which, uh, and also the shape of these bases, right? So you can see that uh, adenine is very different to guanine, right? So adenine has potential uh, hydrogen bond up here and another one here, right? From those two nitrogens. Guanine has one here, here, and here, so three, which is why guanine bonds to cytosine, but not to adenine or thymine. Right, so those hydrogen bonds and the shape are what create the specificity of this base pairing. And that specificity is really, really important because that's how you're able to copy your DNA, at least in part, with relatively few errors every time your cells divide, right? It's also how you generate mRNA, which is a copy of DNA too. So again, lots of these things are kind of really fundamental uh, bits of information. Well, before I forget to, because this is important. You also get a different number. Oh, and just a kind of fun other question. So and this is kind of getting you again thinking about this stuff in a different way. What bases or mix of bases or majority of bases, let's say, would you expect to find in a region of DNA which is readily opened, you know, for transcription, let's say? Would you expect to find more A's and T's or C's and G's in a region of DNA which is readily opened? A's and T's. Why rows? Why more? You're correct. Why more A's and T's? Exactly. Fewer bonds. So fewer bonds, less energy, right? Or more easily broken for the same amount of energy, which is kind of the same thing. Okay, extending on this question, what would you expect to find more of A's and T's and C's and G's in the genome of a hypothermophilic bacteria that can live at 115 degrees Celsius? Would it be the G and C because it's harder to to break that bond then. That's exactly right, because there will be more bonds holding the DNA together. And so for a given amount of energy, they're less likely to come apart. And because you're putting more energy in from the environment, because these organisms live in hot springs or black smokers at the bottom of the ocean, you need, well, it effectively selects for, right? It's not about what you need, it's what natural selection selects for is gonna select for a higher GC content because that will maintain the DNA integrity at higher temperatures, right? So, ah, people calling me. Oh shit. Stuff that underneath my couch. That's actually the uh, Corpus Christi Police Department. Unfortunately, I can't answer it. Um, not because I've been a bad boy. I was in an accident at the weekend. That's why. Um, so yeah, these like really, really fundamental properties also have a really big picture 
uh, role in, say, evolution, right? Adaptation to particular environments or particular roles within uh, different parts of the genome or so on and so forth, right? So that's why I'm really you know, keen for you to understand this because this isn't just some kind of abstract fact that you need to know. This is something that has pretty fundamental importance in some like really varied uh, biology, right? So essentially, DNA is where information is stored, right? That information is stored solely, at least in the case of gen like nuclear genome, in the nucleus, right? We have some, nu some DNA that's stored in mitochondria as well, chloroplasts, right? So DNA itself doesn't actually do anything. And it kind of sits there. It is dynamic right? It's not a static molecule, so it does change in terms of its uh, structure or ultra structure, I guess one would say, right? Between kind of open and closed uh, chromatin and the like, but it doesn't actually do anything in and of itself, right? The things that do stuff are RNAs and proteins, right? And so we basically have to get from this, right? which is our store of information and the nucleus, right? So not only are we talking about what the information is, but also where it's stored, right? So we need to get that information from DNA into mRNA or RNA of some sort, and also out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm, right? That process being called transcription, right? And the reason why it's called transcription is because it's a copy, but it's not a perfect, like an exact copy. It's kind of like your unofficial transcript, right? The original is stored in the registrar's office, I think. And you get a copy of that to give to employers or grad schools or, or whatever, right? You know, mom and dad, if they're pestering you about your grades. Um, and so we're turning this nucleic acid molecule into this one right into from dna into rna so that's why it's called transcription same kind of information uh or same kind of molecule but not exactly the same right and then these with a protein called a ribosome allows that mrna to be translated right from nucleic acid to amino acid sequence right to generate these proteins right and proteins are almost always the things that do stuff. They're not always, right? So here, for example, we have other types of RNAs. We have a ribosome RNA, right? And so, or rRNA, our pirate's favorite RNA is kind of how I think of it, right? And so RNA is what's called a ribozyme. And what that is, an, is an RNA molecule that acts as an enzyme, right? So ribosomal RNA is not translated. It's not a store of information of any sort. It is an enzyme. It's what actually catalyzes the formation of a protein with the help of a ribosome. There are lots of other kinds of RNAs too. RNAs. Uh, are often really heavily involved in the control of gene expression, right? Because this overall, right, even though it's called the central dogma of molecular biology, really it's actually the sequence hypothesis, but this is gene expression, like as a whole, the process of turning DNA into something that does something, right? Whether that something is protein or whether that something is RNA, it's into another form. That's called gene expression, right? But there are a lot of other RNAs, right? So they'd be kind of like, you know, alongside these ones, which are uh, involved in controlling this process through various mechanisms. Those things we'll learn about much later on in the course when we look at the control of eukaryotic gene expression, right? And this whole process will be going over uh, at some length and detail uh, also later on in the course. That would be in the third or fourth section, can't remember which.
Okay. Anybody got questions? All right. So just briefly, and we'll again cover this in great a lot more detail. Um, transcription is really about turning this uh, DNA strand, or really actually this DNA strand, right, into a uh, exportable or transportable copy like mRNA. Right, and so the reason why I actually really, really like this diagram, I'm going to make it, I'm going to embiggerize it a little bit. If I can, come on. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, not that much. All right, hopefully you can all see that. It's kind of hiding a little bit behind my chat box. So I really like this diagram for a lot of reasons. One is it shows the anti parallel nature of DNA. Right, so we have one strand which is going five prime ooh, down here to three prime, and the other strand which is going in the opposite direction up here to three prime at the top. Right, so that's the anti parallel deal. It also shows you the direction in which nucleic acids have to be made. Right, so here is our RNA transcript whether it's mRNA or another kind of RNA, it doesn't really matter for this purpose, right? This is being made as a complement of this strand, right? So you can see all the, the, the little arrow bit here is pointing in the direction it's being made, right? So new bases are being added here. So the next one would be a... Uh, guanine and then a uracil and a uracil and then adenine and whatever, right? So we're going to get bases that complement these. Also shows that uracil is uh, an RNA specific base, right? Instead of thymine. It's kind of on the next slide. Um, sir, but, can you explain what the, I'm just a little confused on what the three and five correlate to. Oh, yeah, for sure. Is that Marissa again? Yes. Super cool. I recognize your voice now. All right. So the three and five represent the end, which end is which of the DNA. And so the five prime end will always be the end that has the phosphate. Because that phosphate, if you look here, I might have to kind of squint, depending on how good your eyesight is. That phosphate group is add, added to the fifth carbon of this sugar. Give me a second, Rose. I'll get to your question in a moment. So if you're counting carbons, uh, you always count from the oxygen clockwise. So it's carbon one, two, three, four, and five. You don't actually see the carbons in here because they're just represented by the points. So the phosphate is attached to the fifth carbon or the five prime carbon of that sugar. Now, you can't add anything to the phosphate. Right, so this end is in a sense kind of dead, right? You can't extend it further, like up the screen, right? Because you can't add anything to the phosphate uh, group. The only thing you can add to is this uh, hydroxyl group down here, which is attached to the three prime or the third carbon. Does that make sense? Yes, that does make sense. And so when we look at the other thing, that's just like behind the scenes. It's just telling us so we know what's going on, right? When yeah, it exactly. it correlates to five and three. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me get it. So essentially, if you were to kind of like zoom in uh, really close, you'd see a phosphate, then a sugar with A attached to it, then phosphate, then sugar with G attached to it, then phosphate and sugar with T attached to it and so on. And right down at this end, attached to the very last sugar, you'd see an, a hydroxyl group. Okay, yep, that makes sense. Yep. Thank you so much. So it's kind of zoomed out. But the really, really important point, though, is that you can only add some anything, DNA or RNA, depending on which you're doing, 
to that three prime hydroxyl group. Because this is essentially what you see the the O that's attached to each of these three prime carbons, right? And these two bases. That used to have a hydrogen as part of it, right? It used to be look like this. But when this new base was brought in, that hydrogen is removed along with another OH and makes water, right? That's the condensation reaction and leaves behind this phosphodiester bond. So you can only make DNA in that direction. You can only add new nucleotides or RNA at the three prime end. That's why the arrow. Hang on, just look Rose's question first. Ah, uh, ooh. That's an interesting question, Rose. In the concept context of the basic mechanics of transcription, no. So in, do, 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 do. come on, get you back there. So in the context of this, the, um, the RNA can only be made in this direction. In the context of RNA processing in eukaryotes, you can actually bind the five prime end to another part, I think, uh, that's right, of the RNA molecule, but we're not gonna worry about that here. Also, I think your question might also be about, well, why isn't there RNA up here, right? Why is it going to this strand and up, right? Well, the answer to that question is that the actual information that's being copied is this strand, right? So this is actually, again, this is a little bit mind bending and kind of early on in the course, but it's a good thing to, you know, kind of get you thinking in this way, right? RNA has to be made in a five to three prime direction, right? But, you always get it going in opposite directions, right? So you have DNA going this way, you'll have RNA going this way, right? It has to be anti-parallel. And so if you want to copy this bit of DNA, right, this kind of bit like hanging off in the breeze over on the right-hand side, this is the coding strand, right? This is what encodes the information. The RNA, has to be synthesized base pairing with the template strand. That's the other one. And that's the only way you can get this RNA strand going in the same direction as this DNA strand that it is being copied from. So that's why this is such a cool diagram, right? Which is like, you know, pat on the back of whoever made this because it is actually fabulous in many ways. This shows you very clearly some of those issues that arise from having an anti-parallel structure of DNA, right? The gene is actually going in this direction up the screen. The RNA has to be made in the same direction because it's a copy of the gene. Get to you in a second, Adam. And so the template, the bit that's RNA is actually being stuck to, that's being read, so to speak, is the opposite strand, right? Called the complementary strand, right? Or the template strand. So anyway, that's just kind of like a, a little bit of an in-depth look, but it's a good one to prime you for later when we get to this in more detail. Um, so Adam, uh, when transcription starts, that's the initiation of the synthesis of this RNA transcript. And so RNA, because it all of these uh, bases are RNA, right? So they're, none of them contain deoxyribonucleic acid. They're all ribonucleic acids, right? So they, they're all different from DNA. Um, but the bases are, or the base that changes is this uracil. So when you make RNA, 
you're copying this sequence over here, right? So if you look, we've got an A here and an A here. We've got uh, a G here. I don't know where that other G's gone. Anyway, can't find it. Right, so we're copying these bases, but in the RNA transcript, we now have uracil in place of thymine instead. So wherever you have a thymine in the coding strand, you'll have a uracil in the mRNA strand. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. No worries. Okay, and that's pretty much just kind of laid out here in a fairly simple way. Now, uh, we're gonna to go to translation first. Now, essentially, we now need to take that information, right? Because, oh, get back, go there. I need a bigger screen, got a tiny laptop, right? That information needs to be translated. Right, because mRNA, again, can't do anything on its own. It's merely an intermediate between the DNA and protein. And so that messenger RNA has to be translated. And it basically goes from three-letter words. These are called codons. Uh, my dog will just have to wait outside. And one codon equals one amino acid. Great. And so we need to translate this information, right, the sequence of the messenger RNA, into this sequence of amino acids. And the thing that does the translating is another. RNA molecule, pardon me, called T tRNA, which stands for trans uh, transfer RNA, because it is basically transferring a amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain. So I probably wouldn't have put that in there. But that polypeptide chain, that's more terms, then has to get folded to become the three dimensional protein. Protein? Protein. Right, so essentially it's kind of like a sequence of, of events. Doesn't necessarily happy, happen exactly like this. This is really to illustrate how you go from one to another, right? The intermediate is this tRNA molecule, which brings in an amino acid, a very specific amino acid, only when it finds this very specific word, right? In the case of methionine, that's always gonna be AUG. That's the star codon, right? So that's essentially the, the basics of translation. and also, it doesn't hurt that RNAs are actually much more complicated than people give them credit for. So quite often people say, oh, well, you know, the difference between uh, RNA and DNA, DNA is double-stranded, right? That's quite a common, I wouldn't say misconception, but quite a common answer. And the, the actual answer is like, maybe, right? Kind of depends on which RNA we're talking about and which part of which RNA we're talking about. So as you can see here, this is, ah, uh, uh, yeah, this is a tRNA. Whew. Whew. Actually, you know what I'm talking about now. Um, I know it's a tRNA. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm really sure it's a tRNA. I think so. Kind of hard, it doesn't have like, you know, it doesn't spell tRNA. Unfortunately, there's no R or N in uh, those four bases. Um, but these structures here, these are called stems, right? And there's another one here. 
Actually, maybe this isn't tyranny. Uh, actually, it definitely isn't tyranny. I just forgot what I said. It's late. That's my excuse. Um, but you, these stems are basically where the, the RNA, well, yeah, yeah, it would have to be anti-parallel, uh, forms double-stranded uh, RNA, right? And forms these really kind of, they're actually quite beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's clearly not enough how much I've had, Marissa. Um, quite beautiful structures, right? Really quite complex structures. And those structures are really important to their function, just as the structure of proteins is important to its function. The structure of these RNAs is as well, right? And so if anybody ever tries telling you that RNA is single-stranded, you know, politely say, it's not. It's actually much more complex than that. Um, excuse me, sir. Uh-huh. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt right no, now. Um, anytime. Give I just had a question coffee. actually on, um, I think it was um, slide seven. I, the like adenine and the uracil, like are they like essentially like, um, like replacing like A replaces U? uh no or the, like i was kind of confused about that oh yeah so this is essentially what binds with what right so mm. guanine always base pairs with silazine whether that's a uh a, a dna guanine or an rna guanine and vice versa but the difference is between uh basically thymine is replaced by uracil so if this were DNA, if you kind of just like hold your hand up like that, uh, adenine would would uh, base pair with thymine, right? If you had two oh. DNA strands. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Because yeah. I was just kind of getting confused on the actual DNA strand and the like letters. Yeah, I thought that's they right. Were like, okay, okay, yeah. well, thank you. Uh, whereas uh, mR RNA, you'll never find thymine. Okay. Cool. I don't actually know why. Kind of weird, but. So you'll only find um, adenine, adenine, adenine? No, you'll find uh, the equivalent of thymine is instead uracil. Oh, okay. So okay, okay. okay. I see me, that now. Let me type that up. That will help. So if you have a, uh, actually, let's get back to this. Can anywhere where you have an A in DNA, right? So this kind of dark gray strand on the left is DNA. Anywhere where you have an A here, instead of having a T because it's RNA, haha, <laughs> cup of tea, uh, you'll have a uracil instead. Oh, so okay. if you, for example, here's another one and another one here. Right, so uh, again, there's another adenine in DNA, and so the matching base in RNA is a uracil. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I in my I think one of my biology classes we like briefly went over this, and I was really confused about it. So yeah, <laughs> that's no worries. What I was asking you. Sorry, but thank you. That's the whole point. Always good to ask questions. Awesome, thank you. No worries. Oh, shit sticks. I actually forgot to go back to this. So, huh. You know how I said that uh, mRNA basically consists of three letter words, right? These are called codons. Well, each codon corresponds to an amino acid. And this is called the genetic code, right? So these uh, tRNAs are the kind of like the translators, right? Essentially. And so this would be the equivalent of a Rosetta Stone, right? Or a, you know, English to Italian dictionary, or even closer to home, an English to American dictionary, right? Which is also sometimes useful, right? So this is what translates the RNA sequence into an amino acid sequence. And so we'll go over this in more depth later, uh, because as we go through translation because it will make a little bit more sense then but it's good to kind of show you this like as you know, ahead of time 
so it's not quite as much of a shock. But one of the key points, which is really neat, is that you just look at this, you'll see that more than one codon or word codes for the same amino acid, right? And this is actually really neat. This is partly because we have more codons than we have amino acids, right? So we have about 64 and we only have 20 amino acids. Part of the reason for that is if we only had a two letter codon, we wouldn't have enough different combinations for all the amino acids. But also this is really neat because this creates a buffer, right? So if you have a certain DNA sequence, right? And for a given codon, the last letter gets changed by mutation. Most times, not all times, but most times, that will not change the protein sequence. And so this is this is called a degenerate code, right? Because more than one word equals the same amino acid. But it's also really cool because it, it creates a bit of a buffer against mutation, right? Because however important mutation has been in our evolution, it's generally speaking a bad thing, right? And we don't really want it to happen. My dog's bugging me. She kind of paused at the door to be let in. And so typically when we talk about mutations, mutations are either don't do anything, right? These mutations, you know, would occur in like the vast areas of DNA between individual genes, right? So they don't necessarily change your, your output from your genetic code. Or if they do occur in a gene, they might occur in the last base of a codon. So even though there is a change, that change doesn't have any consequences, right? These are called neutral. Uh, mutations, right? Or they might be deleterious, right? And that means bad, right? So typically, if you change an amino acid in a protein, many times you'll reduce or eliminate the function of that protein if it's in an active site, let's say for an enzyme, right? So very rarely do mutations actually uh, increase or enhance gene function or fitness or create a new function for that gene obviously they do otherwise you know we'd still be like tiny tiny little single cell things going yum 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 as we kind of wander around a pond or something um but those mutations have accumulated over millions of years individually as individuals Mutations suck, right? You really don't want to get any more than what you already have. And really, that's because most mutations in uh, coding regions typically result in the lack of function of something. And if that something, say hemoglobin in the case of sickle cell anemia, is important, then you'll have an obvious pathology or disease. Right. So even though over time, you know, we have all these mutations, we have genetic diversity that goes through literally like the funnel of natural selection. And over time, that may increase fitness and result in speciation. That's at the population level. For the individuals, usually these things aren't good. Right. And so just to finish up, I'm not going to go through this in depth right, because it's just a table. Uh, but there's some interesting stuff in here, right? It's worth actually reading through. I'll probably just go through it again briefly on Thursday um, because there's some kind of important points to make here, not like the details, but differences essentially. And so what we talk about when we talk about mutations depends on what and where and the consequence of those mutations. Right, and so I'll actually go through that a little bit. It's actually a kind of a fun thing to think about in some ways. But we are bang on the end of our second genetic slugfest of the day. And uh, we have half hour for a ha hurried and harried lunch. 
and I will see you back in lab at two. Shouldn't take too long today. Uh, we're just going to go through some um, kind of ways of thinking, I guess. Uh, this is a different link, Rose. So that will be the third link. Oh, no. Did I send that out through the lab blackboard or was that through? Yeah, it's yeah. on the lab one, I believe. That's right. I was just checking. Um, so yeah, use the one that I sent through from the lab blackboard. Uh, that will be what we'll be using for lab in about 29 minutes. If you're a few minutes late, right, you're kind of running around like chasing the kids or pets or whatever and couldn't get in exactly on time, don't stress it. Uh, but I'll try and start it as close to two as I can. Uh, today, we're, it's not going to take too long, probably like 45 minutes or so. So it's kind of a light day today. Uh, other days, it may take longer. Uh, yeah, we are actually doing a lab today. Uh, Zachary, it's, I'll explain it later because I've got my eye on the clock and I want to have my lunch. Um, but yeah, I'll uh, see you all at two. And then we'll go through like how we're going to be doing lab for the rest of the summer. So see you in a little bit, everybody. And enjoy your 30 minutes of freedom. And I'll see you in a bit.